Welcome to a panel of um, a panel discussion of the crisis in Gaza. A war would be a misnomer uh, because a war implies a conflict between two relatively more or less equal parties. Not what is happening, what has been happening and what continues to happen in Gaza under the Israeli heel. Um, I won't take much of your time in this because we have three eminent speakers here to speak on different aspects of, of what is going on the past, the present, hopefully into the future as well, in Israel, Palestine, Gaza. We have Asaf Oron. He's an Israeli-American born in Boston of Israeli parents who escaped from Poland. Asaf is an anti-occupation blogger focusing on human rights, on dismantling the occupation, and he hopes on changing the Israeli government's attitudes towards Palestinians. He has a PhD in statistics from our own University of Washington. His last place of Israeli residence was not far from the Gaza border in southwestern Israel. He now lives in Seattle with his wife and three children, all boys. He writes in uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. He helps maintain the website for the villages group. We have Nassim Tufaha born in Boston of Palestinian parents who lived for centuries in Ramallah, but they're not permitted to continue living there anymore. Nassim has been involved in human rights activism. He has most recently worked in Jordan, the West Bank, and Gaza in his field of uh, um, information technology. He graduated from Harvard in economics. Nassim now lives on the east side with his wife and three children, all girls. The parallels are interesting. Um, Richard Silverstein, born in the Hudson River Valley. He's been interested in Israeli-Palestinian affairs since 1967. He has worked all his adult life trying to promote dialogues, mutual recognition between two parties, meaning Israel and Palestine. Richard is best known for his blog, Tekun Olam. Yeah, you should read it if you haven't. It's an, er, it was one of the early liberal Jewish blogs dedicated to exposing the, his is dedicated to exposing the excesses of the Israeli state and seeking to protect, as he says, what is left of democracy there. He has featured as far away as Al Jazeera and TVs on Israel, in Israel. He has been published in most well-known newspapers in the country. Um, Richard attended Jewish Theological Seminary, graduated from Columbia University, got a master's from UCLA, and part of, uh, oh, UC Berkeley. Um, yes, UCLA, right, I'm sorry. And part of a PhD from UC Berkeley. He now lives in Seattle with his wife and two children, both boys. I will ask uh, Asaf Oron to start and we will follow it up with Nassim. Asaf, would you come here, please? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me, Richard, and for organizing this. And um, thank you for uh, showing up, a very respectable uh, crowd. Anyone's familiar with the Israel-Palestine talks, and unless it's somebody directly from there, we don't see that many people. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Okay. Um, so as the Reverend said, uh, there's complexities, but, and there are, but many times the complexities are used to uh, distract or, or uh, deny that there's also a universal and very simple and very well-known uh, dynamics and processes at play. So I will start with my own uh, personal connection to, to the region surrounding Gaza and to the Gaza Strip. My wife's father arrived in 1956 in a then brand new but already failing farming community called Shacha, which is about 17 kilometers from the Gaza Strip in southwest Israel. He was asked to go there by the government or invited by by the government to help revive that as a 
promising young farmer. He was 21, he was a recent immigrant from Kerala, India, where his family never really dealt with farming, but uh, they arrived in Israel, the entire community almost, out of a pure ideology and a feeling that when, all, uh, when the Jewish state was set up, um, it was as if the, how do you say, the latter days have arrived and the Jews are supposed to come back. Uh, they were not persecuted in India and they came really out of, you could say, out of love. And uh, two years later, he, he got married to the love of his life, my mother-in-law, in the same place. And I got into the picture 32 years after that when I met the love of my life and I came to visit her at her parents' uh, place. And just like with their daughter, I fell with them in love and first sight. Um, Hard-working people, um, very honest, very, very wise, modest. Um, and I'm pretty sure when they got allotted that uh, small piece of land in southwest Israel, they were not quite aware, or even they were aware, it was told, they were told it was totally all right, what's the recent history of that piece of land. That part of uh, Israel was actually, uh, in the 1948 war, the last undecided piece of territory known as the Fallujah pocket. It's where the invading army of Egypt, part of it got trapped and surrounded by the Israeli forces, but it was too strong to be overcome. So the eventual ceasefire found them holding on to that territory with, with a few Palestinian villages in it as well. And one of the officers were, there was uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser, who later became, a, as you know, the leader of uh, Egypt. And in that agreement, they, they finally, of course, they got out of there because there was an armistice and they had nothing, no reason to stay guarding that small pocket, but the agreement guaranteed that those Palestinian villages, that stay there would be allowed to remain. It took about a year till 1950 when, um, from what I've read, explosions started sounding in those villages and houses started blowing up in the corners of the villages and eventually the villagers left and their descendants now live in, uh, as far as I know, the Jabalia refugee camp, which is the largest uh, and more most squalid maybe refugee camp in the Gaza Strip, about 20 kilometers from there. And we too moved in that region later in the mid 90s, we bought a house in a village not far from Shachar. And these are not the same villages and the same names and exact locations as the Palestinian ones, but, uh, but it's the same land basically. Um, we bought a house there and we moved in and I was somewhat more aware maybe of the history by then but also thought it's all right because now we had a peace process uh, with the Palestinians and you know anyway 1948 we're raised to think that bygones are bygones about 1948. It's beyond dispute so we tell ourselves um, and being I don't know somewhat left of center I suddenly wished well for the people of the Gaza Strip and hope they become free, but the context, the full context, and uh, the potential for future horror um, not dawned upon me back then. I myself have been to Gaza several times, I think maybe once as a child passing through going to Sinai, but all the times I've been there as an adult, were as a soldier uh, wearing uniform and once visiting my brother who was a soldier there and that's all. Um, and that is v quite typical of, of Israeli experience. Gaza, far more than the West Bank even, is guarded behind, was always guarded behind uh, fences and, and heavily policed even when the West Bank was considered docile. So in a way the current situation reflects the attitude and treatment of Gaza since, ever since Israel took over these territories in 1967. 
Um, and uh, and, it, and uh, so, the, so there is a simplicity here. A simplicity here is the people displaced, um, just like other places. If you ever get to read the book called Planet of Slums by uh, Mike Davis, is it Mike? Or, yeah, a scholar Mike Davis. He lists Gaza as the ninth most populous slum in the world. And in the list of those biggest slums in the world, many of them are caused by war and displacement from the mid 20th century onwards. And Gaza is just like those places. Except that in Gaza, um, the West have chosen to vilify the victims, if you will, and, uh, and to prevent any meaningful solution and resolution of the situation. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the Israelis, um, left to their own devices, or the Israeli state taught its citizens, whether immigrants or children or whatever, all kinds of hogwash about who these people are, whether they're in Gaza, the West Bank, inside Israel, or, or in the Palestinian diaspora, and, and uh, how to address them, or whether at all to, to count them as deserving of notice. And the result has been a, a reinforcing uh, a reinforcing cycle of oppression and uh, rebellion, and uh, that both of them took have taken a very, a very, um, how do I say, a very immoral uh, twist. To go back to my wife's parents, so they still live in their home. My father-in-law now is very ill, and they were actually last Thursday, that is, ten days ago. That was the second day of the operation. They had a doctor's appointment in Ashkelon. Ashkelon is the main town, and it's far closer. It's closer to Gaza even than where they live. And uh, during the appointment, my father-in-law was lying on the bed, and the rocket alarm rang about four times. And each time, uh, um, my mother-in-law and uh, the doctor had to run out. That was the instructions. And the security guard stayed with my dad-in-law. And he, he's not, just this few months, he become less lucid than before. And he couldn't figure out why they were running away. So in a way, it's merciful that he wasn't as lucid as he was, because he wasn't mobile enough to run away. Um, so so we're reached, we've reached this uh, situation in the last five, ten years, that the people living around Gaza are traumatized. Um, it used to be a quieter area because the troubles in Gaza were kept to Gaza. And, and what I'm seeing in this is basically a ripple effect. If you, again, if you look at the broad look, you can't sustain a trauma and oppression and violence so intense as in happening on Gaza and, and really uh, really expect to remain completely clear of the effects around Gaza. And, uh, and any, hand, any hand that aims fire at civilians is criminal, no matter what's the color or the nationality of the person holding the trigger. But, uh, but what we've been holding uh, Gaza under, it is inconceivable that we ask for peace and quiet. So my... Uh, my vision for Gaza, first short term, is to see it open up, having a chance for people there to live a normal life. I think uh, Nassim, Nassim, right? Nassim will be more, far more qualified than I to share with you the conditions of the people living in Gaza. But I find so I served in the in the I served in the IDF. I'm not a security expert, but I think I understand security more than many of those so-called security experts. And whoever tells you that security can be arranged by holding a million people uh, in, imprisoned, he's lying to you. There are simply uh, scam artists, con artists. There's no justification and no security pretext can justify what's being done to Gaza, which is basically an open-air prison. Um, so this has to end. Um, and I hope 
with the immense backfire, really, that this operation has been for Israel's government, that we might be a few steps closer to that. The, this operation has been uh, a little bit of a an, of an, uh, demonstration of how much the Israeli uh, narrative, the mainstream narrative, the politicians, the media, the military have been living in an echo chamber especially for the last 12 years, since the collapse of the Oslo process, 12 years, they've been... Um, anyone watches Fox News? So I don't, and I don't have cable, but I hear enough and I see clips. So Fox News would be a mild approximation of the echo chamber that the Israeli mainstream has bubbled itself into the last 12 years. And, and really, I mean, for me, it's comical in one way, but in another way, it's, it's very painful, because these are people you know, I grew up with, I know, and I, I love them. And, and they're good people in principle, but if you put, again, just like we put the people of Gaza in a physical, uh, you know, in a physical bubble and closing it from the world, Israel put itself in a mental bubble and told itself total, total uh, crazy things for 12 years. And, and, and that's how they convinced themselves that this operation could be a good idea on any planet, which is not. And at, at least this time, um, reality um, came back to, to uh, halt them before the damage was even more terrible. I mean, as it is, 172 Palestinians and six Israelis died, as far as I know the count, and uh, that's terrible. But it could have been far, far worse. And uh, if I may end, how much time do I have? Like, yeah, if I may end, I, I, there's some, somebody who didn't deserve credit. I mean, that deserves credit and didn't get almost any credit for the fact that this operation ended so fast. And this is President Obama. And I've seen, I've read, I've, wrote, I've written that. My last blog post, if you look it up, is, is saying that. And I've gotten some heat over that from other anti-war people. Um, the fact remains that this operation ended under seven days and the entire Israeli establishment is, uh, is walking around like somebody who got a kick in you know where. And, and you know, it's not the Egyptian president who stopped them, okay? They play the role, but an Egyptian president that just came into power a few months ago and still can't figure out his own role in his own country could not do it to him, to them. And it wasn't the Hamas fighting either even though that, that, and it wasn't even the resistance inside Israel, which I want to say mercifully is waking up again, but it's still a small minority. It was a, a president that's already been maligned a lot and, and has disappointed us in the first term. He has not been as bold as he could have been with respect to Israel, Palestine. But he has his style, you know, he doesn't go on, on and, and he doesn't use the bully pulpit and, and start verbally trashing people. He works his own ways. He sent the Secretary of State. He called on the phone constantly. He made sure that Israelis uh, give respect to Egypt rather than ignore it, which was all too convenient for the Israeli government if they wanted. And, uh, and you know, when I'm pretty sure that when Secretary Clinton got to Jerusalem and then to Cairo and then flew back to Jerusalem, it was a clear message that she's not leaving without a deal. And maybe that's the first thing she actually told the people in Jerusalem, that she's not going to leave without a deal. So that's why we're here now, not in the middle of the ground attack, because the ground attack was planned. And, and the entire Israeli reserve forces was called up for the first time in 30 years. And if you suspect, like I do, and like most Israelis, or maybe half of Israelis suspect, that this operation did have anything to do with the upcoming Israeli elections, then the most stupid thing that... Uh, a bunch of macho right-wing uh, politicians would do to uh, increase their popularity for the election would be to call up all their reserves, a bunch of macho men like themselves, have them uh, hype them up with, uh, with rhetoric while their families at home might be uh, sitting in shelters and have them stew in their own juice and tell each other macho stories and then go back home knowing that they had a ceasefire and never got the chance to go in. So there was no bluff here. There was somebody stopping them. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that this happened, uh, even if I 
uh, don't have somebody uh, waving a big, uh, a big it's me, it's me sign. Um, and I, I'm also hopeful that in the next four years, even though no one man can bring a change and it has to come from the grassroots and from the various sides involved, that we are going to see uh, also a better leadership uh, from here, from America, for the, for the coming four years. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for joining this uh, important discussion. Um, I'd like to start by uh, just giving you one example uh, of a young person that I've come to know uh, in Gaza. Uh, her name is Leila Abu Dahi. She is 22 years old. She's a student at Al Azhar University in Gaza City. Uh, we've worked together on a number of projects uh, to try to promote development of the technology sector uh, within Gaza. Uh, she is a bright, energetic, talented young lady, uh, full of potential, uh, full of energy, and she lives uh, a fairly typical experience in Gaza. Uh, she's a hard worker, she studies hard, uh, often without uh, power and electricity, uh, often cut off from, from the internet, uh, and persevering through uh, these frequent bombing campaigns. Uh, I've seen her uh, through her disappointments and challenges. She had applied to a number of internships in um, Cairo and was approved, uh, but then wasn't able to travel. Uh, she was rejected in terms of traveling to Ramallah, where we had also prepared uh, a number of technology training events. And so she would express her frustration and, and blog about it, and uh, it was kind of uh, painful to see, but, but a fairly typical experience within Gaza. Um, but I've also seen her development. I've seen her uh, overcome these challenges. Uh, ultimately, she was able to secure uh, an internship in Cairo. Uh, it's one of the first times she was able to leave Gaza, experience the world, and you really saw uh, someone really coming into, into full bloom. And uh, during the past couple of weeks, things were, of course, very tense. Uh, we kept in touch via Facebook and Skype. Um, her Facebook statuses said things like, uh, my neighbor was just killed. Um, also, I'm going to sleep. If I'm going to die, uh, I'd prefer not to be awake to witness it. Um, another one uh, in caps, it has never been that close to my house before. And uh, another one, I need something to distract me from all of this death around. Uh, any app idea for me to start coding. Uh, she put out there, and, and people started giving her some ideas to start coding. Um, I, I'll come back to Leila's story in the end, uh, but when I think about a solution to the crisis in Gaza, I think about what, what would this so solution really mean to someone like Leila. And uh, for us to think about a solution, it's critical that we really identify and recognize uh, what the underlying problems are. And I'd like to just quickly address um, the three problems that I think are really of the, the highest order uh, that need to be addressed if we're going to have a durable solution to this conflict. The first problem is the Zionist expansionism and the effects it has, including the refugee crisis it's created. So problem number one, Zionist expansionism. If, if you look at Palestinians in Gaza, uh, the 1.7 million who are bottled up in this tiny strip of land, 80% uh, are refugees. Uh, they've been denied their right of return for over 64 years. Um, they are um, really uh, living in these conditions that were not created overnight. 
while the international community has ignored them. But, but Gaza is just, is just one example. It's only one example, maybe the most extreme example, but really only one example of this Zionist formula. Right? And this Zionist formula, as it's been practiced, is quite simple. More land, less Palestinians. More land for Jews, less land for Palestinians. And when the Palestinians can't be removed, they should be confined and disconnected, as confined and disconnected as possible. And this is Gaza, this is Jerusalem, this is across the West Bank, across the Jordan Valley, this is across Israel. It's across the Negev in the south, it's across the Galilee in the north. This has been the ongoing Zionist policy to Judaize this land that was originally known as Palestine. And I think this, this problem was made absolutely clear when on a letter on November 16th from the mayor of Upper Nazareth, Shimon Gaps, Gapso, wrote in a letter to the interior minister. We can have a separate discussion about the interior minister and his quotes about bombing Gaza back to the Middle Ages. But in this letter, this mayor wrote as a response to a protest that took place within Nazareth against uh, the bombing of Gaza. He said that he would evacuate from this city, its residents, the haters of Israel, whose rightful place is in Gaza. Now, this example not only highlights how whether a Palestinian is in Gaza or whether they're in Nazareth, they are the same inconvenient demographic threat to the state of Israel. They represent a very inconvenient reality to this Zionist program. But to me, the real irony here is what is this place called Upper Nazareth? Upper Nazareth was created in the 1950s and its whole point was to stem the growth of the historic Arab city of Nazareth and the villages around it. So it was actually put in place again to disconnect Palestinians and it was done so according to this Zionist formula. And I think it was, was described, this policy, this program was described pretty accurately by uh, General Raphael Eitan, uh, a well-known Israeli general, who said, quote, when we have settled the land, all the Arabs will be able to do about it will be to scurry around like drugged cockroaches in a bottle. So Gaza, end of quote. Now this is my quote. <laughs> so, so Gaza, Gaza is a bottle. Gaza is a bottle. You could call it a Bantustan, you could call it an enclave, you could call it a reservation, a prison, you could call it whatever you want to call it. I will use uh, General Eitan's word of, of bottle, but we have these bottles all over. They are still, still trying to make Nazareth a bottle. Jerusalem is a bottle. The cities across the West Bank is the bottle. So here's the point. If we are to solve the problem of Gaza, we first must solve this underlying view that Palestinians can be bottled up because they represent some inconvenient demographic threat to the state of Israel. And to be direct, this means recognizing the right of Palestinians, refugees, to return to their homes. Full stop. This is a legal right. It's a moral right. And the passage of time and delay tactics of the Israeli government in no way 
lesson this right. Problem number two, the occupation of Gaza. The occupation of Gaza has been in place for 45 years and continues to be in place, despite what many commentators have said, that Israel withdrew, disengaged, uh, traded land for peace with all these good intentions. And uh, the reality is that uh, Israel remains the occupier today. Um, as we know, Gaza is a tiny piece of land. If you were to go from the south to the north and try to run a marathon, you, you need to make a U-turn. Okay, you can't make it all the way. If you were to try to go to the east, you're cut off. You're disconnected from Palestinians in the West Bank. If you're to try to go to the west, you can't. There's a naval blockade that controls access to the sea. If you try to go up into the air, you can't. The airspace is reserved for Israel's drones and jet fighters. If you want to go down into the ground to fix your sewage systems, you can't because of the limitations that Israel has imposed upon Gaza. And as the Goldstone Report outlined that in addition to controlling borders, coastline and airspace, Israel continues to control Gaza's telecommunications, water, electricity, and sewage networks, as well as the population registry, the flow of people and goods into and out of the territory, while the inhabitants of Gaza continue to rely on the Israeli currency. This is occupation. And on top of this occupation, as we know, there's been an even more devastating siege for the past six years. I don't know how many people have heard about this uh, red lines document, okay? A red lines document prepared, it's right here in, uh, in full view, all of these charts and, sh and so on, which detail the calorie consumption of Palestinians in Gaza. And what it did was calculate I'll take you through the calculations. That Palestinians in Gaza would need an average of 2,279 calories to avoid malnutrition. And if Israel were supplying all of Gaza's food, that would be 170.4 truckloads a day. But these planners then deducted 68.6 .6 truckloads to account for the food that could be produced locally and then deducted 13 truckloads to adjust for, quote, the culture and experience of Gazans' food, so as to be different than a typical Israeli's consu uh, consumption. And then other counterbalancing calculations led by the coordinator of government activities in the territories, clearly they still view Gaza as part of the territories, to conclude Gaza needed 106 truckloads a day. And in the period between 2007 and 2010, Israel allowed an average of 67 trucks a day. So, if you can calculate people's calories down to the individual calorie, you are an occupier, as well as a pretty sick mind. Now, this is not new. This occupation tightened in the first Intifada. Gaza was enclosed in 95. There have been closure policies throughout much of Gaza's history. So, what is the point of this? Number one, let's realize that this crisis is tied to Israel's 45-year occupation. It predates Hamas. It continues to be in place today and exists whether or not Hamas is in place today. None of us should be confused about that. And if we look at the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, led by Mahmoud Abbas, he's given Israel just about everything it's asked for and its occupation continues, and settlement construction continues at a feverish pace. 
and he has really very little to show for it. So as an occupier of Gaza, Israel has a legal obligation to protect the people being occupied, not to wage war, military and economic war against this population. So the discussion should not be about easing restrictions, the discussion should be about ending the occupation. The third and last problem I'll discuss, Oslo. The Oslo formula. Oslo was really presented as a kind of savior that would end the occupation, lead to statehood, lead to a, a solution. And in my opinion, it may be one of the most one-sided, misunderstood deals created in history. And we're still haunted by Oslo today. It's not something, with all due respect, that ended 12 years ago. The construct of Oslo is still in place today. So what did Oslo, what was the change brought about by Oslo? From Israel's standpoint, it was really a kind of magic formula. In that, it shifted the responsibility for maintaining the occupation to the people who are being occupied. That is really an amazing shift. So it created the Palestinian interim self-government authority that it could now subcontract its security responsibilities to. And now this authority suddenly became responsible for any act, including any act of resistance that took place among any mem member of this population of millions. And as part of Oslo, the PLO renounced the use of terrorism, which I think everyone can agree with, but also any other act of violence. And it assumes responsibility to prevent violations and discipline violators. So Oslo put in the requirement of maintaining complete peace and quiet. And any time there isn't complete peace and quiet, that means the Palestinians are not meeting the obligations of the agreement that they signed. So that is really becomes the only role for Palestinians. Maintain peace and quiet for Israel. And what can Palestinians do in that scenario? Well, they can bring issues to the negotiating table. And Israel can say, yes, or Israel can say no. And I think we know that quite often Israel said no. And during the 1990s, while peace negotiations were happening, if it wanted to double the number of settlers over the West Bank and what was this territory that was being discussed, it could. And it did. The US was not there to counterweight hold Israel accountable, uh, you know, would have to, of course, uh, disagree with Asaf around the role of Obama. I think it's an interesting theory, but in my view, a U.S. president could not be more one-sided than Obama has been, including in the most recent crisis. So we have, just, just two minutes, please. So we have a situation today where no one is holding Israel accountable. Not the US, not the UN. And why do I bring that up here uh, and talk about this construct of, of Oslo when Hamas has not agreed to Oslo and doesn't recognize Oslo? Well, because I believe that the same formula, basic formula has carried over and Hamas is operating with similar expectations now that the PA has within the West Bank. It is responsible for maintaining peace and quiet in Gaza, whether these acts are created within Hamas or by some other group outside of Hamas. That's what this agreement, that's what these ceasefires are about. And we know that when conditions are so bad and occupation continues, there is some percentage of human beings who eventually choose not to stay quiet. This is a basic fact of life. So. 
what do we do? I think the answer is really two simple things. Number one, we need to focus on these core issues. We cannot solve this problem until we unwind the Oslo formula, until we end the occupation of Gaza, and until we recognize the rights of refugees over the ongoing Zionist expansion. People need to know that. We need to remind people of that. The second one, we need to create some accountability in the system for Israel. Today, it has all the choices, all the carrots, and none of the sticks. And there's an important global BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and there are very concrete steps that people can take. So, to close, I'd like to bring this example back to the story of Layla. And while she was born in Rafah city, she does not consider Rafah to be her home. To Layla, her home is Ramla, currently in Israel. She's never been there. Her grandmother fled when she was a 13-year-old girl on a hot day in July of 1948. This 13-year-old girl was baking bread. She heard screams that the Zionist forces were attacking. And despite her hurry to escape, she took the baking supplies with her as she believed this was only going to be a momentary thing. And this refugee grandmother now tells a story of starting to bake bread in one country and finishing breaking bread in another country that she's remained in. Now, her granddaughter Layla not only deserves to live without the threat of bombs, but she deserves the right to reach her full potential. She deserves the right to return to the place she considers home as much as any young Israeli does. And personally, I don't think we should be bound to the construct of Oslo that was architected by the late Prime Minister Rabin, who is a hero to many on the Israeli left, because as we know, it's Rabin himself who architected many terrible things in his life, including the expulsion of Leila's grandmother and 60,000 other unarmed civilians in Ramla and Lidda when he was a lieutenant colonel in 1948 and signed the expulsion order. Lastly, the late Edward Said wrote in 2001, the weapons the weak and stateless cannot ever give up are its principles and its people. To unendingly defend the high moral ground, to keep telling the truth and reminding the world of the full historical picture to hold on to the lawful right of resistance and restitution, to mobilize people everywhere, and to depend neither on the media nor the Israelis, but on oneself to tell the truth. When will we as a people resume, assume responsibility for what, after all, is ours, and stop relying on leaders who no longer have any idea what they are doing? It is this spirit that expresses my humble intention of being with you here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nassim, and thank you, Asaf, for speaking to us, and thank you, everyone, for coming. A week ago, I had this uh, crazy idea in my mind that there was about to be a war in Gaza, and there was about to be an invasion, and what could I do? Um, I didn't want to sit there folding, folding my hands in my lap um, and saying uh, there's nothing that I could do um, other than sit back and watch this disaster unfold. And I started calling some friends locally, uh, some activists locally, and said if I tried to organize this program, would you know, do you think it would be a worthy idea? Would you support it? And most, almost everyone um, said yes. And so that's how this event started only a week ago. And thanks to uh, that network of people and thanks to Facebook and Twitter, uh, the social media, we have all of you here tonight. And I want to thank you for, for coming. 
Um, some of those people that I spoke to that were supportive were um, Dick Blackney, who's been my partner in uh, speaking locally against the possible war in Iran, Israeli-American possible war in Iran, and Jeff Siddiqui, who's been our moderator tonight, and Judith Kolokoff, and uh, Jerry Haynes, who's about to leave tomorrow for Gaza. Um, I want to thank all of them for sharing this uh, vision of mine and, and helping me uh, make it happen and bring you here tonight. And there's someone who isn't here tonight who I want to uh, remember, and that is uh, Brenda Bentz, who I've done a number of these events uh, in the past couple of years, and Brenda passed away a number of months ago, and I, she was my partner in doing these sorts of events, and um, I, I'm thinking of her now. Uh, in her memory, um, and, and she's here with us in spirit. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a complex story, has many elements, many actors, and many roles. But essentially, it's a three-legged stool. One leg is Israel, one leg is Palestine, and one leg is the US. In my own person, I represent two of those legs. Unlike Asaf, um, my friend here, here who spoke uh, earlier, I'm not Israeli. I'm an American Jew, but by virtue of my upbringing and my identity as a Jew, Israel has played a critical role in my life. Its policies and its security and its well-being are important to me. It's why I write the blog that I've written for the last nine years every day, turning out um, material that um, tries to build support for um, peace and justice in that region. Since I was a teenager, as Jeff said, I've devoted a major part of my life to envisioning an Israel that was peaceful, democratic, and tolerant. At one time, most American Jews and Israelis shared such a vision, but gradually what one might call a liberal Zionist dream has been trashed and discarded by far more radical elements in the Zionist camp, like the ultra-nationalists who now control Israel. Unlike Israel's current leaders, I believe the fate of Israeli Jews and Palestinians are inextricably intertwined. What, one, what harms one, harms both. There's no way one can succeed and triumph unless the other does. If one fails, the other will fail. In short, they must live together or die together. There are many reasons why I do what I do and write what I write. Among them, I want the American people and their leaders to know that there are American Jews who are not apologists for the worst excesses of the current Israeli government. I want American Jews to know that if their leadership or organizations want to become reflexive defenders of the Netanyahu government, there are those in this community, like me, who won't allow them to have a monopoly. And finally, I want Israelis to know that there are American Jews who care about Israel, but who will not stand idly by while this country sells its birthright for a mess of porridge, tramples on democratic values, and massacres Palestinians and their supporters, whether they're American or Arab. I'm here to tell you something that you already know. American and Israeli policy in Gaza is a failure. Every argument offered by President Obama or, or Prime Minister Netanyahu to justify the siege and the recurring series of wars and assaults fails on its face. Some of you may have seen Yusuf Munayer's op-ed in the New York Times yesterday in which he offered the same analysis. And I was very pleased to see the pages of that august establishment um, media outlet open itself to um, uh, someone who is who dissents from this liberal Zionist uh, uh, approach that the New York Times tends to take in his coverage. The Gaza siege is not only a violation of international law because it, it um, international law prohibits collective punishment of civilian population, it doesn't even serve a pragmatic purpose in Israeli terms. There are two ar arguments that are offered in favor of the siege. That it stops terror attacks against Israel and it counters the popularity of Hamas, which 
in Israeli terms, is a terrorist organization. The recent assault called by the euphemistic biblical term pillar of cloud or pillar of defense, and we can talk a lot about that at another time. That's another interesting misuse or use of, of uh, religious uh, terminology. Proved that Hamas has been able to arm itself despite the siege. It proved that the siege, if anything, strengthened Hamas and didn't weaken it. By almost every account, the latest crisis has rendered Fatah and the PA completely irrelevant politically. This suits Israel just fine because it wants no viable representative of the Palestinian people with which it would be forced to negotiate. Since 2006, when Hamas won the, the elections uh, to, uh, for the Palestinian Authority, the U.S. has boycotted Hamas, refused to speak to it or recognized it. This has meant that despite weighty matters that needed to be discussed by both sides, like the Shalit uh, prisoner exchange or ceasefires during Operation Cast Lead or the ceasefire that was announced a few days ago, none of them could be discussed with the major interlocutor, which is Hamas. It meant that Egypt, led by the Muslim Brotherhood, had to take a lead role in representing Hamas. And, and, and Egypt under the Egyptian Brotherhood is not exactly the, the country that is uh, the fondest uh, in the eyes of the United States or Israel. So in effect, they have, they have bolstered the prestige of two, uh, uh, two movements, two nations that they would uh, prefer not to have, have done that. And this is what their policy has, has caused. The announced terms of the ceasefire this week showed possible cracks in the facade that, the, that Israel and the U.S. have created uh, regarding Hamas. Not only did Israel agree to unrestrained movement in the border zone, it agreed to relaxing restrictions on Gaza fishermen and to end the siege. In truth, it offered to change those procedures in the context of negotiations that would be led by Egypt. And as you know, Egypt is going through its own domestic drama right now, so we're not sure what's happening with those negotiations, but Hamas, in the New York, according to the New York Times, says that there already have been such meetings, which to me is a very good sign. Israel, of course, refuses to concede there have been meetings, and refuses to concede that it will make any changes, but that is almost to be uh, expected. The New York Times also announced that Gaza fishermen have, for the first time in, I think, six years, gone beyond the Israeli-imposed three-mile limit for fishing, and they've gone six miles out, and nobody from the Israeli Navy stopped them. And this is remarkable, uh, because those fishermen uh, have a long history of being terribly harassed by the Israeli Navy, by, by their ships being sunk and, and, and them injured and not being able to fish. So um, this is another change that we hope is going to uh, continue and be expanded. A few days ago, 2,000 Gazans celebrated their newly won freedom to move within the Israeli-imposed no-go zone on the border. And unfortunately, the IDF rewarded them with bullets, which killed a 20-year-old Gazan farmer and wounded 10 others. Israel, I think, paid a heavy price for that act. Um, because I don't think that anyone uh, outside of Israel uh, had much understanding of why it would be necessary to kill an unarmed civilian just because he was taking a walk in land that was his, which he was hoping that he'd be able to farm again. We don't know what exactly was agreed by the parties negotiating the ceasefire. There may be side agreements, secret side agreements. Um, there, um, but. Um, if they do lead to lifting the siege, it can't happen a moment too soon. Israeli IDF General Gyor Eiland, who is not a dove and not a leftist, said at the height of the Gaza uh, uh, incursion of the assault last week that Israel has only one choice, one pragmatic, realistic choice in relation to Gaza. It has to recognize Hamas, it has to end the siege, and it has to demand that Hamas be accountable for things that happen in Gaza. Um, it, 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 um, and that, in his mind, is the only way in which Israel can expect that there can be any quiet in the south and any security there for its residents. 
This is unfortunately exactly the kind of pragmatism that is, is met with, uh, is treated uh, with a resounding dud by policymakers in Washington or in, in Tel Aviv. Um, and I'm sorry to say that President Obama, I think, is among them. Um, he failed to compel Israel to uh, respect a settlement freeze in the beginning of his term, and ever since then he's been um, AWOL on, on this issue. Um, except that uh, we should, I should concede that Asaf is right, he did play a role in negotiating the ceasefire and I think he deserves a certain level of credit for that, although I'm highly critical of all the things that he didn't do that he could have done um, aside from that. I don't think that Obama would have made the effort that he did in the ceasefire unless he felt that a, an invasion of Gaza would have upset the apple cart of all the other issues that he needs to deal with in the, in the Middle East, the main one of which is Iran. A possible invasion of Gaza threatened um, his ability to negotiate his way out of the Iran impasse. impasse. Um, I've made the argument in my blog, and, and this idea was originally given to me by Dick Blackney, who's, who's with us tonight, um, that <clears throat> Obama was as supportive as he was of the Israelis, refusing to criticize them, uh, conceding that they had a right in, in his eyes to defend themselves from Hamas's rockets, um, because he needed to build up credits in the bank uh, with Israelis in the Israel lobby when he planned later on to take a more conciliatory approach towards Iran. Now, I don't know whether that is actually going to happen. I don't know what will happen with Iran, but my sense is that he wants to take a position that is very much opposed to the Israeli position uh, at the right moment of negotiations with the Iranians. I have to concede that it's a losing proposition to bet that Barack Obama, who I call the Democratic Kissinger, would put forward a principled, far-sighted proposal that would resolve all the differences with Iran. But I think we can expect that he might be able to put forward some proposals that would um, be pragmatic and would lessen tension and would end the chance that Israel or anyone will go to war against Iran. Um, which just as a few days ago, there was a real possibility of there being a war in Gaza, I still think there is a real possibility of there being a war against Iran. Even a scaled-down U.S. agenda like the one that I'm talking about will anger the Likud and anger its, uh, uh, Israel's supporters in Congress. And that may be why Obama left his, uh, kept his powder dry relating to Gaza, and he appeared to back the IDF. There are those who argue in Israel and elsewhere that the Gaza assault was a test run for an Israeli attack on Iran. An article in the New York Times honestly compared Israel's attack on Gaza to what happened in the Spanish Civil War in which Nazi Germany uh, uh, provided the weapons for Franco to fight and win the war um, there. And that, in a sense, was a, uh, a dress rehearsal for World War II. Um, the Iranian brilliant Iranian graphic artist, Mana Neistani, drew a cartoon image of Bibi in the air, and he had in his hand that crazy um, uh, exploding uh, cannonball that he showed when, during his UN General Assembly speech that was supposed to represent the Iranian nuclear bomb. And in this cartoon, Bibi's body dissolves and the bottom of his body dissolves into the shape of bombs being dropped on Gaza. So in that sense, he's, he's managed to integrate visually this whole notion of Gaza, Iran, united together. The fate may be united together. I hope that's not the case, but the, you know, it's a very compelling visual image. I'm afraid, my friends, that we have to wage this war for peace on two fronts, one in Gaza and another in Iran. It makes it very hard for us, because no sooner do we stop one bit of mayhem than we have to turn and face the prospect of another. 
but I'm confident that in the long run, history bends in an arc toward the just and not the powerful. We've only faced the Gaza siege for six years, only in quotes. The Israeli occupation for 45 years, the Nakba for 64 years. No one thought the Berlin Wall would fall or that the Soviet Union would implode. No one thought peace would come to Northern Ireland, that Kosovo would become independent, that the siege of Sarajevo would end. In 1954, no African American would have ever dreamed of voting, running for office, or becoming president, as happened in 2008. Who would have thought a year ago that Aung San Suu Kyi would be a Nobel laureate and that she would welcome uh, Barack Obama to Burma in the first visit by a US president. We have to be optimists, despite the immense suffering that Gaza has endured. Injustice can't continue forever. There's a scientific principle that given a choice between a simple and a complicated proof of a problem, the simpler answer is always right. This is also true in politics. A status quo that is contorted into moral knots cannot survive. Eventually, it will collapse under the weight of its own inconsistency and lies. Simple, basic truths and realities will win. Eventually, there will be justice. There will be Palestine. Hamas will be recognized. The siege will end, not because Israel will want it, but because common sense and pragmatism will force the world to understand it must be this way. The alternative is endless war, bodies stacked like cordwood, and a barren, desolate Middle East dragged, which drags the rest of the world into the maelstrom. No one wants that. Thanks a lot.